Hey, welcome to Flipping Over Rocks, a podcast series aimed at uncovering the intersection of psychology, neuroscience, and creativity. I'm Tony Lyons, and I've spent 30 years in brand marketing trying to find creative solutions to difficult marketing challenges with some success and some, let's call it, less successful ventures. I flipped over a lot of rocks. So I decided to try to unpack how creativity is influenced at the most biological level by speaking with neuroscientists, educators, and psychologists. It's time to get curious. Thanks for joining us. I'm here today with uh, Brogan Van. Um, uh, Brogan holds a master's degree in counseling psychology from Athabasca University uh, and an honors uh, BA in psychology from Carleton University amongst the whole bunch of other certifications. Uh, welcome, Brogan. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, this is yeah great. it's great to have you. Thanks a lot for uh, yeah. for helping us out. Like our series is trying to unpack the idea of what yeah. creativity is in its various forms, and yeah. you know, just generally around the uh, the notion of yeah. of creative thinking, what it means yeah. to be a creative person, how to yeah. how to be creative if you don't yeah. think you're creative right. and all of these types of things. But the specific thing I wanted to talk to you about yep. was uh, was how you as an individual and how our brains process mm. creative feedback. Yeah. And I know it's an area that I think you have some expertise in because you deal a lot with uh, mm. with child and youth in the mental, in the mm-hmm. mental health space. And a lot of that is about acceptance and about mm-hmm. their perception of themselves and how to interact with others and all the rest of it so yeah, yeah. so uh it, like on your travels like mm. w- w- have you noticed there are certain attributes of a of a creative person um, would you be able to actually unpack what that means yeah yeah no that's a great question and one that was sort of uh fun to reflect on a little bit more as i think we there's can be sort of maybe sometimes it's a bit of a stereotype of this image of what a of what a creative person is like and i I think that the more that i really reflect on it i sort of thought you know what like really broadly speaking or I've, I've found maybe as I've gotten older, the ability to just appreciate just a broad variety of creative ap- attributes, right? And this ability to sort of be, uh, I think, kind of open-minded and flexible and willing to take some risks and this kind of idea of being thinking outside of the box a little bit, sort of pushing back, trying to, you know, take a different a different perspective. I'd say the more kind of maybe the, the more... Uh, like almost like a parent, more creative types. I see people who can tend to be a bit more impulsive, excitable. Those are some interesting things that I noticed that maybe stand out a bit more from some of those other qualities. So it may be just from a bit of, you know, I'm sure that lines up with, with you know, research and a lot of us see, but to, to look at that more broadly is interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've always thought like, you know, people say, Oh, um, oh! I'm not creative. I'm mm-hmm. I'm an accountant, or I'm, I work in numbers, and I'm not creative. I, t- and it's my opinion yeah. that creativity is a fundamental human attribute. Yeah. Like all that it really is is that mm-hmm. the ability to envision something that doesn't exist, yeah. and, and envision a future state. And that could be a math mm-hmm. problem. It could be a painting. Yeah. It could be a song. It could be mm-hmm. a business problem. It could be a relationship issue. Mm-hmm. But it's it's problem solving and the ability to envision a future yeah. state, and I think yeah. that's that. You know, there are other species that have that somewhat. Like some of the more developed primates can do that, but most animals can't actually do that, yeah. right? So, yeah. so I think the creativity is a is a is a, a foundational yeah. human attribute yeah. in some ways. Yeah. 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 Oh, I totally agree with you there. That really that ability to, and actually anything that's looking at sort of act, attributes or a way of looking at creativity, that it's, it's not even necessarily being able to identify something, you know, a new idea, something just maybe different, something that would, hadn't been considered, that's maybe been used in another situation that hadn't been considered for a different situation. So it's just that, I think that, that where that flexibility piece is, is a really big one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We, we, in our preamble there, we, we were chatting yeah. about, um, uh, the notion of patterns, you know, and mm. I'm I'm really interested in this because I, yeah. I've done some, you know, pop psychology research, I guess, sure. you know, I'm not a, by sure. no means a scholar on it, but there's lots I of am, great info out there. Yeah, lots yeah. of really bad info too. Oh, that too. <laughs> <laughs> but some of the things that I've, I've uh, you know, come across is this this notion of pattern mm. and pattern recognition. Yep. 
and that our brains actually crave these patterns. And when patterns Mm -hmm. are not present, you actually invent your own patterns. And then that starts to turn into these cognitive biases that you might Mm -hmm. have, you know? So what can you tell us about, and from a, from a psychology Mm -hmm. perspective, um, what can you, what can you tell us about patterns and how our brains are influenced by patterns? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, great question. And, and and really, when I think of patterns, I think of how, uh, I mean, it's kind of, the, for sure, the notion around, you know, biases are a big part of that. But a big piece is this, as how we sort of seek, uh, we seek familiarity, and we, and we crave it as humans. And I think that's the biggest piece I think of when I think of patterns, um, is this idea that we want to be able to, uh, well, I think maybe the big first piece is we, we like to be able to, we, we are meaning making creatures. And so we're always trying to make sense of whatever is in front of us constantly. You know, we often don't even, uh, we're not even really aware that that process is happening. And so we're always trying to take in whatever information is around us. We're trying to make sense of it. And patterns are a really nice way to organize that and try and make sense of it in conjunction with, okay, then we like to look, okay, what's familiar. And we use that, you know, what's already knowledge we have and we're familiar with to make sense of new patterns and um and and so it's just this really kind of helpful convenient way for us to to structure and make sense of information although we can get sort of stuck with it too or or, or create patterns that maybe uh are, are not helpful at looking at things in certain ways or um from the familiarity piece i find that sometimes we we uh you know get so stuck looking with for what's familiar that even if it's uh, information that's not accurate or, you know, not useful for us, we go to it because it's familiar. So we, we sort of think that's, that's safe, that that's gotta be it. So, so that's kind of an interesting angle. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really important thing for creative people in, in our industry, because we, yeah. we're basically trying to create messages or, right. or memes or familiar patterns mm-hmm with a with a view to influencing our behavior right yeah, so yeah. um you know as a as a brand marketer uh, yeah. you want people to to buy a thing yeah. or think a certain yeah. way or yeah. you know uh, join a join a thing you yeah. know become part of a movement in the in the, maybe mm-hmm. in more the uh, social enterprise or not for profit space yeah. you know so I do think it's really incumbent and it behooves our, our, us as creators mm-hmm. to understand mm-hmm. the power of pattern mm-hmm. and to and to build patterns into into our into our messages. Yeah. Um, although one thing that I I I, I have noticed is um, the influence of 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 patterns on well I haven't noticed it I've read this because <laughs> again I'm not a scientist. <laughs> oh, good. But, I, but I've read it is that the influence of patterns on dopamine right. production in the okay. brain right so mm-hmm. i'm 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 fascinated by dopamine because it really okay. gets to the root of how we as marketers and brand mm-hmm. communicators mm-hmm. can influence uh, joy and uh, yep. pleasure with yeah. a view to influencing behavior, right? Right. So the, right. what i've read and maybe you can challenge me on this but what i've read is that um people will uh, g- get a dopamine hit from a pattern Mm-hmm. But they're more likely to get uh, to to act upon a pattern that's not perfect. Mm-hmm. So okay. is, now this is a, and it was a it was a it was a some research from it's old old stuff. Okay. It's from okay. the Olds and Milner's nineteen fifties okay. rat okay. experiments. People okay, and they were talking about that. They noticed that um, that, that the fragmentation of the pattern or a broken pattern okay. actually has a has a higher propensity to <gasps> impact behavior than okay. than a familiar pattern. Because basically, okay. I think the idea is you just get into like a um, an inertia. Like it's mm-hmm. just like you, it, you 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 get into the pattern and it gives you joy, mm-hmm. but it doesn't actually shock you into doing mm-hmm. it anything unless it's slightly broken mm. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm very happy for a st- that's to neat. challenge me on that but I- no I'm gonna say I to be totally honest that's I, I think I've you know historically I've learned bits and pieces of that but but you you know might know actually more about that than I do really specifically <laughs> that uh that yeah that that's that's really uh that's interesting for sure and that I mean uh definitely in terms of uh you know how again those that information we take take in how that can have you know such a visceral emotional reaction right that's that's super interesting but um but but i think uh you know it makes a lot of sense in terms of that a little bit of an and i think also then why we sort of seek a bit of that interest creativity sort of piece that it's that fragmented pieces it's just enough to sort of say okay this is familiar it's comfortable but it's just something different enough to sort of 
pull me in or wonder, want to learn, want to learn more. Um, and so I think sort of from a, from a, you know, marketing sort of perspective that uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. But I'll be honest that I don't, I, you've sort of, now you've piqued me interest to do more research around that specifically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. If something good comes out of this. That's great. So I think patterns yeah. is a really good segue to get into uh, really what I wanted to talk to you mostly about was sure. uh, was the um, processing feedback. First of all, how to how to give feedback right. and then how to process feedback as a creative right. person in, in our field. Right. Yeah. So a lot of the time what we'll get is um, as a creator, we'll get uh a client who will say, and maybe they just don't know how to how to mm-hmm. actually give feedback properly. They'll say, mm-hmm. I just don't like it and I can't tell you why. Mm-hmm. You know? And that's totally fine, but it, it it's yeah. it's very difficult to react yeah. to that because then yeah. you have to make a, you know, well, I don't really know what, what I'm supposed to do with that, but sure, I'm gonna go back and give it a go as a professional, right? Yeah. So um and then mm-hmm. on on the on the other side of that equation, you're gonna get uh a creator who's actually nurtured this little or this child of theirs, right. That they've created and they're very proud of it. And then somebody comes in and basically kills it. Right. They go like, I hate it. I hate that thing that you created. And it's, it's hard. Like as you get older and you get more, um, you know, uh, familiar with the process, you just, it's just part of, part of what it is. I've I've always said to young people coming into the industry, and it's a little bit of a crude analogy, but <laughs> if, um, if if you're not comfortable taking your shirt off in public, do not come into this in, yep. come into this industry because you're basically doing that every single yeah. day. Because yeah. everything you do is going to be public, and it's going to be judged yeah. in a public forum, and it's going to be successful or unsuccessful. Yeah. So yeah. you gotta you gotta wear a thick skin, otherwise yep. it's not going to work out. Yeah, yep. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so. Having said all of that, um, yeah. when when you're dealing with your clients, and I mean, mm. a lot of them would be dealing with um, ideas of rejection or you know mm. uh, acceptance. Like, what what would be some of the techniques that you would tell them on, on how to handle criticism? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. And um, you know, there's uh, I, I've got some sort of ideas in terms of the you know, and maybe we'll jump back to that in terms of you know the the process of you know how uh, how that criticism is put out in the first place but but definitely a lot of ways that we look at in terms of how to how to manage all sorts of different types of criticism feedback broadly um and from a kind of a, a cognitive behavioral lens which is a is a big part of sort of my approach um there's this uh, idea of uh, cognitive reframing is a is a huge thing that i do with a lot of the young people i work with and and even parents in terms of really being able to uh recognize that how we think about whatever the situation is what we're hearing our own thoughts uh you know how we think about things really affects how we feel and what we do and so that's all so connected right and so um there is i mean i'm giving a really simplified version but this idea of really being able to identify what what are those thoughts about a situation be able to sort of challenge them and and reframe them right so for example um i I mean the really the one that i've been really sort of chewing on uh, is a sort of idea of um you know uh, negative feedback and it's sort of you know the kind of the really basic basic question is is why does negative feedback have to be negative feedback right or is it feedback it's just feedback it's just feedback right Right. Or, or or growth feedback or uh feedback that is 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 you know, is, you know, telling me X instead of Y, right? Like shifting it to be able to use it in a way that actually is, is helpful and, and doesn't get it stuck in, um, sort of the, uh, something else I was going to sort of chat about is sort of a very kind of typical, um, it's a threat response when we get negative feedback, it absolutely Mm -hmm. produces this sort of anxious triggers our anxiety system threat response. Uh, we don't like rejection as, as humans, (laughs) right? We know that it doesn't feel good. <laughs> we're ultimately tribal right we want to belong to something and then when yeah. you get rejected like the, the client doesn't like my ad headline or whatever mm-hmm. i feel rejected so therefore i'm i'm i'm, I'm ostracized from their uh, sphere of yes. tribe 
Like, you know, I guess. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like such a primitive idea, but still rings so true today, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's very much connected to that. And it's, and it was, um, you know, in terms of being able to, I mean, especially hard when we're dealing with someone who maybe has given very uh, feedback in a negative tone or or the words, you know, are just inherently feel very negative. And so we've got to work harder to sort of figure out, well, what do we do with that, right? And I think part of that can be recognizing that didn't feel good to hear, right? Uh, What is useful information? that I can take from that that allows me to actually grow or do something with this that that uh, I will feel proud of that my clients will feel proud of that sort of thing uh, I'm thinking more in your sense but but even with maybe with my clientele right to sort of uh, looking at a lot is whether they're struggling with sort of their own perceptions or understanding of you know who they are you know feedback from parents their friends uh, how do we again make sense of that information that is actually helpful more accurate that allows us to sort of get push through maybe some of that other uh, kind of negative stuff. So, so that's, a, that's a big thing. And, and, and that can also be really connected to this other big thing that I spend a lot of time talking about with, with uh, the young people I work with is all this idea of fostering a growth mindset. Um, yeah. and, and really the, the, the big piece there is shifting our thinking of uh, I can't to I can or I can't yet. Uh, Carol Dweck does a beautiful job actually of sort of talking about this idea of kind of the power of uh, you know, I can't yet sort of offers this path of being able to still move forward versus just failure sort of leaves us nowhere. So, so even these small shifts in our perception and, and how we're handling that makes a huge difference. Right. Right. What did you call it? A growth mindset? Is that right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Yeah. And can can we just unpack that a little bit, just totally. to, just to, <laughs> just because yeah. it is interesting. Yeah. So so what do what do you what, what does that actually mean, like uh, in 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 real world? Like what? Yeah. How do you how do you break that down for somebody? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and, and so I think it aligns very much with this. You know, often when we sort of see uh, creative thinkers, and I think what creative thinkers try to sort of foster, um, but but essentially, um, growth mindset is often kind of set in comparison to uh, a fixed mindset. Um, so fixed mindset, sort of kind of this idea of feeling stuck like uh, I can't do it this is too hard this is a lot of kids I work with right no I just can't do it it's too hard Um, sense of feeling stuck a lot of rigidity Um, and so the idea of a growth mindset or thinking in in that sort of a way would be the opposite so seeking uh, you know opportunities that that it's not uh, this is not the end. I'm, I'm learning and I'm growing. Uh, mistakes are a part of the process. Um, there are different ways to, to move forward. Um, uh, but, but being kind of within a, within a realistic sort of way, though, right? And so I sort of like this idea of uh, really centers on this idea of um, maybe I haven't gotten it, but I haven't gotten it yet. I will get it. Sure, maybe I'm not there now. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't inherently have to mean I've failed, right? And that's, so I can see maybe that could, that can often happen where we get this negative feedback and it's like, ah, I failed, that sucks. I have to keep working on this. Um, but shifting it from, you know, maybe as a as sort of a ladder of progress. Okay, so I'm still on this ladder. I haven't quite met where I, the expectation where I think it should be or what the clients are hoping for me. And that just tells me I'm still on the ladder and, and that's okay. Um, yeah, that yeah. sounds like, I mean, that sounds like... Um, it would be absolutely crucial for somebody in a creative field because yeah. if creativity is about this idea of envisioning a future state, yeah. well, if you're in a state where I can't envision that, I'm stuck. Yep. I don't know how you're going to be creative. Like that's like so you, yeah. you would almost have to have a growth mindset right. uh, if you're working in the, yeah. trying to develop creative materials. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's interesting. And what about yeah. so that's that's accepting feedback or criticism Mm -hmm. what what would you say to people who are um giving feedback or who 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 have a different opinion about something and need their opinion to be heard or uh influence an outcome what would you say to those people in terms of how to give feedback yeah yeah absolutely because i think there's a lot of uh, power and 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 ways to um you, you know have the outcome change dependent, you know, very dependent on how that's actually given. And so uh, I think the most immediate thing I'm thinking of based on your sort of early example of, you know, I just don't like it. I just don't know why. 
Oof, I think that's the hardest for people to hear because right? <laughs> it's it's clear that it's a, a not good and but we're lacking this information about what went wrong or what can I do better right so so you know any sort of ambiguity around that I think is particularly challenging so the, so the need I think for things to be um, clear uh, I'd say expectations are really important around this too and it's sort of this idea of when we you know like how are we expecting feedback what's that process going to look like um having even i think structure around that can be really important so that both parties know what to expect in terms of what this is look like what can i expect to get from this uh, normalizing this process of feedback and again that it doesn't have to be uh, just inherently negative feedback this that we're feedback let's see where we're at in this process we know the goal is to reach here and you know the, mm -hmm. the, where the the project is at a place where everyone's happy uh, and appreciating that we're somewhere between here and there and and we're checking in and we're trying to figure out what that's where we're at um so so really kind of normalizing this process knowing what to expect um being able to get lots of information um it, sort of in line with sort of the growth mindset stuff um really being able to put uh value uh on the process like of the creative process actually can support that that process as opposed to we often put so much emphasis on this will be great when the project is done <laughs> yeah on the on the outcome but the process is, uh, is actually yeah, ignored right? yeah and and so some interesting kind of recent research i came across was talking about how when we can you, you know within organizations that sort of thing when we really uh, show that we value that creative process we really help to foster it and increase people's uh, capability to be really in that sort of creative mindset. So, uh, so all really, really important pieces in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in your, in your work with, um, with young people, I mean, I'm going to make some assumptions that sure. uh, social media and the concept of belonging and mm -hmm. tribalism and even FOMO uh, mm -hmm. is, I see it with my daughter, like the, this, like FOMO is a real thing. We, oh, used, to, for sure. we used to joke about it. <laughs> It's very real. <laughs> but it's very, very real. Yeah. And, and I actually think is, uh, again, to bring it back to the, the marketing and, and brand yeah. communications yeah. field, um, I do think that brands need to understand this idea of tribalism. Like, yeah. you know, they need to understand this idea of belonging mm -hmm. and they need to be liked. They need to be liked by their consumers. So mm -hmm. they need to behave and act like humans and they mm -hmm. need to have empathetic qualities and qualities of value and all of those things. They can't be corporations. It just doesn't work anymore. I mean, they, technically corporations, but they can't act like corporations. Gotcha. So why is it so important for us as humans to be liked? Why should, why do we care about yeah. that? So yeah. Yeah, great question. And and I think, I mean, a big part of it ties back to, I think, what we touched on earlier on and, and really this idea that, um, you know, as humans, we exist in relationship right um and uh, you know the 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 feedback and what happens within those relationships really feeds into uh how we see ourselves and and um sort of our narrative around that so um that's really really at its core is that you know we we need other people those are and that's such a definitive part of who we are and how we exist so if we're not liked as sort of i think as you mentioned right then it creates this um creates a sense of uh oh like really feeling like in danger like for for a lot of people it really mm -hmm. creates this sort of the sense of a, like a genuine anxiety response of this is i'm in danger i mean you know actually we're not in danger if other people don't like us but it really like actually creates a very true uh threat response for us yeah uh which is which can be pretty scary so it's i'm, I'm it's yeah i'm sure it's terrifying i can't mm -hmm. imagine being a uh a teenager or a young person yeah uh, especially no, that. because because their 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 personal brand is yep. out there for everybody to yeah. see i didn't have that when i was yeah. a teenager yes you know i mean so i think this giant social experiment that we're doing with yeah. um yeah. the concept of, concept of individual as brand is yep. is an experiment that i don't think is really going that well yeah. to be honest i think it's a lot of stress a lot of stress <laughs> and it's an always on stress right yeah yeah, yeah. So, well, yep. Well, I just wanted to kind of unpack that idea of yeah. of, um, of personal brand. And we talk mm -hmm. about it, like you see it on LinkedIn and this whole mm -hmm. like, photographers that make a living out of yep. personal brand photography and people, yeah. the whole selfie culture and, you know, building up your own story and influencers who get paid to do things like, yeah. so I, 
I struggle with it a bit because I, 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 I get why it is and, and, and you know, why it's happened and all, and all the rest of it. But I, I, I look at it and I go, well, how, what impact is that having on the, like society at large? Like, you know, mm-hmm. if you have a bunch of fake things, they're essentially a version of yourself that's really not the real version of yourself right. so is there any studies around that that should like what is actually happening to our societal structures when everything is fake right <laughs> great question and and sort of something that taps into a bit more of my my knowledge something that i spent some time studying in in, uh, in my graduate program but sort of the impact of social media especially with young people um, and, and so something that's interesting is, is really, um, it, we're starting to understand that's more, uh, social media is really used in different ways and, and, the, and depending on the way it's used by young people can sort of depend on whether this is actually having sort of a, a healthy or unhealthy impact on, on young people. And, and then still sort of trying to figure out whatever the, the greater, you know, more macro impacts there. But, but when I say sort of being used in different ways, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of research that we'll look at actually that social media can provide this really great opportunity for young people to, to, you know, really put themselves out there and actually kind of explore and experiment. Who do I want to be? What is, how, what do I want to sort of, how do I want to sort of show up to the world? You know, even though, you know, it can be sort of this, this is very curated, you know, how accurate is it? Um, so there's definitely, I think, a, a danger there, but there's definitely a po- positive side in terms of experimenting and being able to see, and talk about feedback, right? A lo- immediate feedback in terms of mm-hmm. how do other people receive that? And then, so what do I think of that? So so I think there's a part of that that is actually a very uh, normal and, and healthy part of adolescence, but, but it's just been dialed up a ton and 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 so that can be tricky right that it's you know all is fine if we've sort of created this identity and we feel good about it and other people feel good about it and it's a chance to connect with other people like us great mm-hmm. but the opposite can happen it can be really intense and and or you know we're more likely maybe to be less our true selves because that we're so influenced by all these other people so um, so, so, so that's, that's tough. I definitely, I, you know, where the research where it says is good is where the, you know, people are, luckily we're, we're seeing a bit more of this, uh, I see, you know, a big call for authenticity through social media, yeah. trying to be, so it sort of feels ironic because I wonder, right? Like, well, how authentic is this? Because it's still online. It's still, you know, mm-hmm. being curated. It's, a, so. it's still a construct, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's a, it, it could be based in the truth, but it is still a yeah. construct version yeah. of the truth. Right. So exactly. Mm-hmm. So so it's really really tricky to know that that there's definitely lots of positive feedback in terms yeah. of where you know i think young people it's been helpful but but the opposite happening too and so uh i find when there's more active use and like in terms of uh, like intentionally interacting with others uh that's that's a it's a generally a good thing for young people and, and the world around them but but more the passive use which i think tends to happen more in terms of i call it the kind of the the scroll holding forever you know the endless comparison to others the FOMO, I'm missing out. That that can become more dangerous, actually, than more than anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, uh, I think we mentioned it earlier on. This this notion of um, of change and how yeah. you know people um, say that they want change and ask, especially in our field, like make make me something different. Yeah. And I know they don't want anything different because we <laughs> and we talked a little bit about patterns. Yeah. So. Um, a lot of what we do in our field is trying to get people to change their mind about something, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So, um, first of all, in, in, in your opinion, like, why, why are people, fund, are, I guess it's more of a question, are people fundamentally against the idea of change, first of all? Yeah. Is there certain types of people that are more open to change and people who are more intransigent? Um, so, like... What, in, in your opinion, as a as a as a psychologist, like you know, what what is why are people so against this idea of change, mm. or are they so against this idea of change? Yeah, yeah. So so I think um, change is is hard, but we're not against it for sure. Uh, and and I think change is is hard regardless of the change. There can even be really positive, fantastic changes we're looking forward to. Still difficult for us 
because of a lot of this, you know, that we seek the familiarity, we like stability, security, we, we like that. We also get bored of that. And it's mm -hmm. normal that we have times where we're maybe bored or we're seeking a little bit more vitality. We've got curiosities, dissatisfaction. And, and so we do, we do want change. We want it in different ways. And I think a personality type can play a big piece into this too, right? We know one of, kind of, one of, the, one of the core sort of aspects of personalities is sort of like, you know, openness, openness to ex new experiences, that sort of thing. Um, so I think that's, a, that's another factor there. So yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know that kind of answers the first part of your question. Well, I mean, it's highly individual, right? I guess that's the thing. I'm, I don't know how you guys actually do your job because I mean, every single person is yeah. is has a completely different set of, of you know yeah. uh, psychosocial influences and yeah. you know genetics and epigenetics and all yeah. this kind of stuff you know yeah. so i don't i i it's commendable that you even are able to make any impact on people's <laughs> lives so it's yeah. it's pretty amazing but i mean the, at the at the end of the day we, we're all bags of chemicals with neurotransmitters yeah. and, and you know <laughs> And little yeah. electrical impulses. So there are yeah. some commonalities between how we how yep. we interpret things. Yes. Yep. You know. So I mean, um, is it do does that vary in your experience from um, from uh, either uh, sex or gender or uh, you know age or ethnicity or, or different? You know, there's a million different mm -hmm. types of humans, right? So, mm -hmm. but are there common factors that are common to everybody? Do you think? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, within the context of change, though, I think it's it's interesting, and I, I'm almost, uh, you know, culturally, I think it's really interesting, and I, now I'm curious to sort of kind of explore that even a little bit more, because I'm certain, it, I'm, I'm almost certain that it would uh, vary, you know, culturally. Um, I, I think of adolescence, again, as a period where, for sure, there is uh um you know this time of sort of individuation and wanting to develop identity all that there's definitely a desire for more change risk taking some of these sort of stereotypical behaviors you hear about so so I definitely think there's different uh stages of life where we're more I see we're more likely to, to kind of seek change I don't see a difference between uh genders um uh yeah so so still for sure very individual in, in life experience i think for for actually mm -hmm. really talk about that individual piece right i think life experience really is probably one of the bigger impacts here in terms of based on our experience with change uh i work from a really big attachment lens right so how and you know when you were little how secure did you feel right, right. things felt kind of secure in my with my primary caregivers i'm going to be a lot more comfortable with maybe being able to go out, explore, try different things, because I know that that's kind of a safe thing to do because I'm able to kind of come home to my secure sort of base, so to speak. So so I that's a big sort of area of kind of my uh, my focus around some of this. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we talked about uh, authenticity earlier on. I want to yeah. talk about the other big A word in our in our industry, which is acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and really uh, interpreting um, what other people want from us. Like, you know, and, you know, we're going to use words and expressions and body language to, to try and make people understand mm -hmm. what, what, uh, what we want from them. Yeah. Um, but is, are there, are there ways and techniques that you can, as a, as an individual interpret what someone's actually asking you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because <laughs> it is hard, like you know, because different people communicate in different ways. But it, like, you know, if you're, are there techniques where you can unpack a, a request, um, or 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 um, or even, you know, uh, negative comments, for example, online. If someone's being bullied, can you unpack that? And how do you like? How do, are there techniques for for understanding what somebody is actually saying to you? Mm, it's a good question. It's a tricky one. And and I know I'll be really honest, and this especially just within my therapist skill set, like really, uh, you know, it's a huge, huge part of my job. It's just, you know, those active listening skills and, and trying to, uh, if anything, I really try to avoid sort of trying to, uh, you know, interpret avoiding assumptions and asking questions. And I think it's really about asking the good questions when needed, mm -hmm. or if, when possible, you know, if you have access to the person where you're trying to better understand. So uh, my goal is to always trying to, you know, avoiding um, 
trying to to do any of that, you know, trying to decipher assumptions, figure it out, and, and always be able to to clarify when needed. Ideally, with that other person or party, in terms of, you know, here, here's what I'm hearing. Do, you know, does does that? Am I on the right track, or does this what, what you think yeah. it looks like? Saying saying the thing back to the person, like, yeah. and how you and and how you understand it. I, yeah. I find that that's a good technique. It's yeah. very basic, but it when is. you when you when you decipher what they say or what you, yeah. what you think they said, and then you say yeah. it back to them and they'll go, well, that's not what I said at all. Yeah. And you go, yeah. well, that's what I heard. <laughs> right, right. And, and it seems so simple, but I think because we're so quick in our day to day, it it's becomes very normal that we do tend to, well, I mean, it's normal. We have our bias and we make assumptions. We're constantly making sort of little judgments and assumptions. So being able to actually be really mindful of that, like what's sort of our uh, happening in our own narrative and biases and, and, you know, getting them down to help inform, you know, the way that we do you know, perceive or interpret whatever we're hearing from other people, uh, I think can help us be more clear of that in terms of, you know, how we can be a bit more uh, responsible for sort of the own, the way that we interpret things. I think we can learn a lot about ourselves, right? And right. Bring, bring that into the relationships that we have. So, right. Yeah you, yeah, you you mentioned active listening, and I and I, you know I hear people say that expression, and I I go, I actually don't know what it means. So right. Can you yeah. explain what that it's, means? It's a great question, uh, and I think the the most uh, you know kind of for simplicity's sake, the the most important part of that is is being able to listen uh, without um, without having a response prepared because this is something else we often do without even realizing it is we listen oh, yeah. to respond that's <laughs> funny my but my buddy always says that he says you're not listening you're, you're just waiting to talk but, so there. <laughs> some, some people who are more in tune will, will catch it but but it's a very subconscious process for a lot of us this idea that we're we i mean you know for whatever different reason again we want to feel like like we, uh, I mean, yeah, depending on the conversation, sometimes it can feel, you know, there's, we're more like, oh, I need to make sure I say the right thing, or I need to make sure I get my response in, or, uh, right. but to, to be able to feel like we can slow down and to, uh, I mean, of course, we've always got our stuff going on, but to even just acknowledge it, I'll do this with the young people I work with, to just, uh, it's actually like, can almost be like a bit of a mindfulness exercise to like acknowledge, right? You've got, there's the, there's the hamster wheel that's always going in our brain to sort of acknowledge that and say, like I'm going to pause this and just really try and gather everything I can from what this, you know, the person in front of me, what I'm, what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, and that, that will just inherently show through, through your body language. Right. But, but we really, there's so much that we miss that, and just being able to just intentionally really grasp onto all the words and everything we're grabbing from that other person. is That's is, interesting. Uh, so, you, so it's essentially clearing your mind of any so pausing it, saying it's there, pause, but yes. Okay. And then, <laughs> really listening to the person's words and only responding to what they say, not to the, the pre um, conceived idea that you're already, already yeah. created. Yeah. Uh, Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. So yeah. little, little things to, to change, but often little things that we're yeah not aware of. So awareness is a, is a huge, uh, yeah, a huge tool to develop there. Yeah, yeah. Lots of A words today. Authenticity, yeah. acceptance, act, active listening. Yeah. Awareness. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. Like it. yeah. So Brogan, this has been really helpful. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm oh, very glad. appreciative of you spending the time to help us um, mm -hmm. understand a little bit more about what happens when we process feedback and, oh. you know, a little bit of positive techniques for understanding feedback. And mm -hmm. it's not it's not negative feedback. It's just mm -hmm. feedback mm -hmm. and going into it with a growth mindset yeah. and everybody becoming active listeners. Yeah. I think if we I do that, that, we as creative uh, professionals, we'd be, we'd be better at our job. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a good start. It was my pleasure to, to be able to chat with you about this. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you got some value out of our time together. I know we've barely scratched the surface of this enormous topic, so... Join us next time and you know what? Let's flip over some rocks. <laughs> <laughs>